No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. And we've got a great program. Here's what's coming up. We're going to begin with our devotional time, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of our scripture. Today, we'll be looking at Matthew 25, the first 13 verses, where Jesus tells us a parable to warn us about being prepared. So get out your Bibles, turn to Matthew 25. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Roger Campbell joins us, and he's answering a very important question. How does a person get into Christ? Jim Dearman will join us with some sound words about the medicine of hope. We'll head over to Cody Boston's corner of the world and hear about a helmet that we should be wearing. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton and Troy. Is the rich man and Lazarus of Luke 16 literal or figurative? Well, I hope you have your Bibles open up to Matthew 25, where we read beginning at verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Here in Matthew chapter 25, we're in the last week of Jesus' ministry. He just answered three of the disciples' questions at the beginning of chapter 24. He explained to them about the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem that was to come in A.D. 70. And there were signs that they could look for about that coming destruction in A.D. 70. Then he went on to talk about the end of the world, the judgment day. And there would be no signs for its coming. And he then gives a series of parables to explain this fact. Well, what's a parable? That comes from two Greek words, meaning to cast alongside. And a parable is a story that we can relate to 
and it's used to explain a more abstract thought, something that maybe is a little bit harder for us to understand. So taking something that we know to explain something that's a little bit more difficult. And in our New Testaments, we read the Jews just use these quite often. And Matthew and Luke record most of the parables that we have uh, available us to, to us today. And sometimes the Scripture actually explains to us the meaning of that parable as Jesus was explaining it to those he was speaking to. And this just happens to be one of those. So as we look at our text, we can see that there were 10 virgins that were waiting for the groom who had been delayed. And they needed oil for their lamps uh, to allow them to safely go out into the dark. We have the five wise that had their oil, and then we have the five foolish that didn't have enough oil to make it through the night. Now, that was a matter of preparation because they didn't know how long they were going to need it. And when the time came that the need was there, the five foolish asked to borrow but there just wasn't enough to go around. So they had to go out and buy some oil at the very last minute. And it just so happened that while they were gone, the groom came back. There were only five left that were able to go with them because the other five had gone to buy oil. And by the time they made it back, it was too late. The door had been shut. There was no second chance. They were not allowed in. In fact, they were told rather forcefully, I do not know you. Think about that. A bride going to her groom and him saying, I don't even know you. That would be a tragic situation. Jesus then gives us the conclusion for this. He says, therefore, the explanation of the parable for us. What does this mean? You need to always be ready for the return of the Son of Man. You see, back in chapter 24, he talked about all those different signs that would happen. Uh, all those signs that we, they would have for the coming destruction of Jerusalem. From verses 4 through 35, he talks about those signs and all the things that they could do. And then in verse 34, he says, all these things will happen during that generation. But then verse 36 begins with the word, but, that, that word of transition, this is something different. Now he's going to talk about the coming judgment day. And the point that he's making from here on out is that there will be no signs. We had signs for the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, but the coming of Jesus, there will be no signs. So we need to always live our life in such a way that when Jesus comes, we'll be ready. That's the point that he's making from verse 36 all the way through the end of chapter 25. There will be no second chance. When the door closes, the answer will be, I do not know you. One sad thing that we learn from this is not everybody who thinks they will be saved are going to be saved. Let that sink in. We need to make sure that we've, do, we've done what he says we need to do, and that includes baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Are you ready? He wants to save you, and that's good news for us today. Now, Roger Campbell joins us to answer the question, how does a person get into Christ? Be ready always. How does a person get into Christ? In the New Testament, we often read about blessings that are in Christ. But how does a lost person get into Him? That's a really important question. How would you answer that? Or to be ready as a Christian to be able to give a defense or an answer? 1 Peter 3 and verse number 15. Well, think first of all about the wonderful blessings 
God makes available in His Son. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 and verse number 3 that in the Christ we have all spiritual blessings. A little further down in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, redemption is in the Christ. Romans 8 and verse 1, in Him there's no condemnation. 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 1, grace is in the Christ. And then 1 John 5 and verse 11, eternal life is in God's Son. So those amazing blessings, they all come from God and they're all available in only one place. That's in Christ. So if a lost person knows that it's only in Jesus that these blessings are available, then one who wants to be saved wants to know the answer to the question, how do I obtain those? What's required of me to get into the Christ? What about believing in Jesus? Is that necessary in order to be saved? Jesus said, he that believeth is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, John 3 and verse 18. In the context, he was talking about believing in him as the Son of God. And so there's no doubt that in order to be saved or get into the Christ, one has to believe in Jesus. But listen carefully. The Bible never says that one believes into Jesus. We believe unto in the direction of salvation, but we don't believe into Jesus. What about repentance? Well, that's required. The Bible says in Acts 3 and verse 19, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So repentance takes us in the right direction, but it doesn't get us into the Christ. Same thing with confessing faith in Jesus. With the mouth confession is made unto in the direction of salvation, Romans 10 and verse 10. And so while believing and repenting and confessing faith are taking us in the right direction, and they're certainly required, none of those individually or collectively get us into the Christ. There are two New Testament verses in which we learn how to get into Jesus. One of those is asked in the form of a question, Romans 6 and verse 3. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? How'd they get into Christ? Baptized. The other verse is Galatians 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now that's God's answer. That's the Bible answer. That's the answer we want, and that's the only answer that we're going to give. The way to get into the Christ is by being baptized into water baptism for the remission of sin. I'm Roger King, and this has been Be Ready Always. All those great blessings are only available in Christ, so getting into Christ through the penitent believer's baptism is critical. Thanks, Roger. We offer a free Bible course to help you do that very thing. We're going to give you our contact information, then we'll be joined by Jim Dearman. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. The easiest way to enroll in our Bible course is on our website at gnttv.org. Just click where it says Bible course, fill out the information, and we'll mail it to you. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about the medicine of hope. We will live eternally if we obey 
There is no medicine like hope, no incentive so great and no tonic so powerful as expectation of something better tomorrow. How true are those words from Orison Sweat Martin? We live in hope of better things. However, many are hoping only for something better tomorrow in a material sense, when the greatest hope should be a spiritual one. Man has become consumed with the material, while the better tomorrow spiritually is ignored. Jesus asked, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Savior also advised, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Thanks for that, Jim. There's a lot of past Good News Today episodes you can get from our apps. They're available for Android, Apple, and Roku free of charge and can be found in the App Store. Now it's time to turn our Bibles to Ephesians 6 because we're going to see what's going on in Cody Boston's corner of the world as he discusses the helmet of salvation. Welcome to Cody's Corner. Today I want to talk about helmets. And uh, if you've ever played baseball or, or football or those kind of sports, softball, that, then you are familiar with those type of helmets. If you've ever ridden a bike, then you've probably worn a helmet. Hopefully you've worn a helmet. If you've ridden four-wheelers and those things, usually people wear helmets. And it's all to provide protection for the head, right? You wear a helmet in baseball so that uh, the ball doesn't hit your head or, or a bat or uh, some other uh, type of head injury happens. Uh, you want to avoid those things, and so you wear a helmet. Same with football. You wear a helmet to avoid having this injury to your head. Um, with bikes, in case you have a wreck, you want to make sure that your head is protected. And same with four-wheelers and other things. So helmets offer protection specifically to your head, to your brain, to this area of your body. And as I think of helmets and I think of the protection they offer, I, I think of, of Ephesians 6 and the armor of God where it talks about this helmet of salvation. So I want to ask you to go to Ephesians 6 for just a moment. In Ephesians 6, in verse 17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation. And as you think of our armor, you see we're going off into battle every day. When we go out into uh, the, the workplace, uh, when we go out to the grocery store, uh, wherever we may go, we go out to the ball field to watch our children play baseball or softball or whatever else, wherever we may go, we are going out into a battlefield every day. Life as a Christian is a battlefield for the church, for God, for His kingdom. And so as we think of this battlefield, we have to be prepared. We have to have the right uh, armor as we go into battle. We've talked about things like, uh, you know, before things like the helmet and the breastplate and things of that nature. And one piece uh, of this is that helmet that we've talked about. And with the helmet of salvation, with this protection being offered to the head, they would have thought about the helmet worn during battle. The helmet that uh, a Roman soldier would wear, which would protect your head from injury, from, from things getting to the brain, from, from anything that might cost you your life. And those particular helmets, uh, they were made of this tough iron or, or bronze that had these cheek guards, and there was this, this inside spongy material that would make the weight bearable of the helmet. And the reality is, a lot of people today, I don't even know if we have the neck muscles to hold up that kind of helmet, to wear that kind of helmet uh, around. But they would wear these heavy helmets to protect this very important part of their body. So the helmet of salvation. You know, as I think of that, I think a lot of people walk around unsure of their salvation, hoping that maybe they'll be in heaven one day when this life is over, but not really being assured of that reality, not really having confidence of that reality, in a way, honestly, kind of doubting their salvation. And so as we put on and take this helmet of salvation, we put it on, 
we're protecting our minds and reminding ourselves that we are saved by the blood of Jesus. Paul was confident in his salvation. When he talks about finishing the fight and, and keeping the faith, finishing the race, fighting the good fight, keeping the faith, how can he make that statement? Because he's confident in his salvation. He knows there's this crown of righteousness waiting for him. For us, we have to have confidence in, in our salvation, have this protection. Don't let those doubting things get into your mind that cause you to doubt your salvation or to doubt God or to doubt the power of the blood of Jesus. Trust in it. Know that you're saved by His blood and take that helmet with you everywhere you go, protecting your mind and finding confidence and courage in the truth that you've been saved by the power of the blood of Jesus. Well, that's it for my corner of the world. I hope that you have a blessed day. Thanks, Cody. We've got a great way for you to start every day, and that's with the Good News Today podcast. Just search for Good News Today Daily Devotional Time wherever you get your podcast and start every day with your daily dose of good news. In just a moment, we'll give our Bible question to Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. And our question for Guyton and Troy, is the rich man and Lazarus of Luke 16 literal or figurative? Hey, Troy, I got a question. What question do you have today, brother? Are you my friend? I am your friend. So do you love me? <laughs> In Christ, I do. I love you, brother. Well, man, that means a lot. So would you die for me? Well, that I would like to think that I would. But, uh, you know, Christ said, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. So I guess I got to, God. <laughs> so would you literally or figuratively die for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Jesus was talking about literal there. So where are you going with this? Well, a lot of confusion gets to be made sometimes when people speak. Sometimes they'll say something like, Man, I'll die for you, man. And, oh. you know, these are my brothers on the football team. I'll die for them. Uh, that's, Do you really mean that? that I think I they mean you. that figuratively, not literally. Now, Jesus, certainly, I agree with you, meant that literally we should be willing to die for our fellow man. And certainly, there's so many men that have, and women that have done that. Yeah. And so the question that we get today comes down to that literal and figurative. They want to know is the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 literal? Or is it figurative? Mm. Now, it, you know, good question. We, we've answered this before, I think. And um, normally we see it something to do with like, is it literal, uh, a, an event that took place, or is it a parable is what some people ask. So I'm not sure if that might be where this question comes from, but uh, either way, the answer is going to be the same. And the simple answer is that it's a literal event. There's nothing to yes. cause us to figure figurative. Normally, when you see figurative, it's like, as, similar. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason to know, like recently we were talking about the transubstantiation mm -hmm. theory. Um, well, if Jesus is there and he hasn't died on the cross, he hasn't broken his body, he hasn't spilled his blood, it tells us there's bread, there's juice, and that is the blood and the, and the body. That was a figurative exactly. situation. So the context sets that for us. Exactly. In Luke 16, there's nothing read here to set a context for us that this would be figurative. Yeah. And let's not forget that even, you know, some things that people want to equate as, as being figurative, Jesus made literal because for example, he referenced Jonah and the big fish. That means that was real. That wasn't just a story. Same way with Noah and the ark. And so whenever he's talking about these things, he is 
telling us about reality. And there's another thing that I can go to scripturally in Revelation chapter 20. You see where at the end of that judgment scene, it says that in the New King James, verse 14, Revelation 20, verse 14, that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So you see a separation there. Mm -hmm. There's death, there's Hades, and then there's hell or the lake of fire. So that shows me that this place that Jesus is talking about in Luke 16, which we have come to know as paradise or, or Hades, uh, the I Hadean like to say realm, the Hadean realm. Hadean realm, exactly. Because you kind of got two places there. Exactly. Is, is a real place. It's a real place. And so he references things that are real. Um, he says there was a certain rich man, and then there was Lazarus. He uses a specific name, which yeah. parables don't use that. That's right. Um, and a lot of times the scriptures will tell us he spake to them in a parable. It, uh-huh. That's not It there. doesn't say that. That's right. But if you're watching this, you're not familiar with it. I think it is important that we understand what the literal meaning is of this, is that when we die, is that there are two places our soul can go to await that judgment day. And that's either to Abraham's bosom or to the place of torment. Mm. And that's referred to as the Hadean realm. And where we go is but determined by what we do here on this earth. That's right. As Lazarus followed after God, heeded the warnings of the teachers and the prophets. And so when he died, he was carried into Abraham's bosom by angels. But the rich man, that while he was living life up here on earth, He did not heed the teachings, Mm -hmm. and so he was carried away to torment. He was in pain. He was in anguish, and when he realized it was too late for him, he wanted uh, Lazarus to be sent back to his brethren, and they're told they have the prophets. Let them hear them. So the message to us is let's prepare for that time because it is literally coming, and we will be judged and determined by what we do in this life So let's listen to what the prophets have told us. Amen. We started out this episode talking about a parable, and we ended talking about an account that was not a parable. We encourage you to always check all religious teaching against the Word of God to see if it's true. Be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11 and search the Scriptures. Spend some time, be diligent, and make sure what you're hearing is the truth. If you'd like to hear our program again, you can do that through our websites or apps or a podcast. We even have transcripts available on our website and apps. If you have a question, contact us. We'd love to hear from you. We might even answer it on the program. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. Always good news, good news, good news. There is good news today. Good news, good news around the world. Always good news. Good news, good news. There is good news today. All around the world. Good news, good news around the world. Always good news. Good news, good news. There is good news today.